Good morning, students. Welcome to week three of Human Resource Management. This week, we're looking at chapter six and chapter seven. This lecture will be on chapter seven, developing and training our people. The human resource side of any organization is the most important side because it's the actual people. And as I said, in uh, the first video for this week, that's one of my mentors over my shoulder there, Ron Pinkston, a dear friend, but also a key mentor in my life. And uh, it's appropriate to have one of your mentors looking over your shoulder um, and just helping you move forward, helping in your training and helping in your development. So let's jump right into our slides here for week seven. All right, training and development. Training and developing the people within our organizations. Learning outcomes. Number one, discuss the scope of training and development and its strategic aspects. Number two, describe how training needs assessment should be conducted. Thirdly, describe the factors that must be taken into account when designing a training program. Fourthly, identify the types of delivery methods that organizations use for their training. And fifthly, explain how the effectiveness of training programs are evaluated and describe some of the additional training programs that different organizations use. The scope of the training is really determining that both training and development as you'll see down here, these two terms tend to be combined in a single phrase, training and development, to recognize the combination of activities that organizations use to increase the knowledge and skill base. Remember the KA, the KSAOs, knowledge, skills, abilities, and other aspects. And so we're continuing to bring that model home that we learned in chapter one. And research, check this out, research shows that organizations' revenues and overall profitability are positively correlated to the amount of training that that organization provides for its employees and volunteers. So we're looking at a strategic approach for training. And you've got four phases to this. The strategic model of training and development. Notice that this is in the shape of a circle rather than a line. So this is continuous. We're always in the state of learning, aren't we? No matter how old we are, no matter what we're doing, we can still make adjustments, and we need to, in a constantly changing culture and society, both as pastors, as business owners, um, even within different stages of your marriage. My wife and I will be married for 33 years this next month, and you do go through different phases of your life. And so you are in a constant learning cycle. Well, phase one is the needs assessment. What kind of training do we need? So you first of all have to look at your organization. Again, you look at your organization's mission. What is it that we're trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? Now let's look at the tasks that are necessary within our organization. And then let's look at our people, the people that we don't have, that we want, the people that we do have that might need specific types of training. And then phase two, now let's design the training. What are our objectives? What kind of trainee readiness is there? We're looking again at the intrinsic and the extrinsic motivation of our employees and key people. And then the principles of learning. And we're gonna look at a, a learning wheel that shows some pretty interesting things about different aspects of learning because not everybody learns exactly the same way. And then phase three is the implementation. What are we actually gonna do? What are the methods we're gonna use and what are the outcomes that we're looking for? And then as we employ and bring to the forefront the training that has been conducted, we then evaluate whether or not the training that we provided did the job that we wanted it to do. And then you'll see we go back into phase one again, and this is a cyclical process. So this is the strategic model for training and development. Great resource for you. So phase one 
you're looking at hard and soft skills, and you can see the list here. There's really a fork in the road on two different major types of skills that are needed for any occupation. And some of them are hard skills, and some of them are soft skills. And you, you, you can look pretty, it's pretty basic in understanding that you're talking about one is learning to do things, and the other one is learning to work with people. The only one that might not quite fit in that category is customer service training. And for whatever reason, the uh, writers of this textbook, um, and they're well-trained and educated themselves, decided to put it over here. So there are the practical application factors of customer training, uh, customer service training. But you could also see that it would fit over here in the soft training skills as well. Then this breaks it down a little bit further. I'll let you take your time with that. The organizational, organizational analysis, it's pretty straightforward. It's an examination of an organization's environment, goals, strategies, performance, and resources so that you can determine what kind of training is necessary. Then you look at the tasks. What kind of tasks are we looking at? Then you look at your people. And then you start to match the tasks and the organizational objectives. You look at your, your people in your organization now and say, okay, what kind of training do they already have in relationship to the kind of training that they need? And then we go to phase two where we start to design it. This is where we set it up. And notice here, again, the readiness of trainees and their motivation. Remember the intrinsic and extrinsic types of motivation. We also, we can't put it all on the student. We have to have good teachers. So the characteristics, the approaches, the commitment, maybe even the motivation of the instructors themselves. And again, we're talking about that principles of learning wheel that will come up here shortly. There it is. Principles of learning. And I believe it's nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And right in the middle of that, you'll see that these are the principles. These aren't all the details. These are the actual principles because everybody learns differently. Um, my wife and I have two different types of ways that we go about tackling even reading a novel. I'm a slow, steady plotter when I read a book. I might read the same uh, pages over two or three times because I get excited about something. Well, my wife reads 10 times faster than I do. But we'll joke around and tease later that whatever I read, I retained it. But that doesn't make one learning style better than another. It's just important that we know that there are different principles to learning. Phase three, we're implementing it now. Remember KSAOs, knowledge, skills, abilities, and other factors, other contributors, other attributes to how someone learns. And we want to choose the right methods. Then, Inside of that, we see on-the-job training. And I want to point out to you that what's pretty fascinating here is, for the most part, this is the approach that Jesus used. Think about even your reading assignment for this particular week in Matthew chapter 9. It was the on-the-job training. Jesus told Matthew, come follow me. That's on-the-job training. You're going to go do what I do. You're going to watch me. You're going to apprentice under me. And the other thing that Jesus did is he gave his disciples special assignments at different times. He said, okay, I just want you to take this, this, and this. Don't take anything else with you. Go out and practice what I've been training you to do, what you've been watching me do, and then come back and we'll talk about it. This is the proper way to do on-the-job training. And this is a really helpful tool. I'm not going to go through it right now, but use this in your organization. It'll give you um, a method. It'll give you approach and a particular approach. And then you can adjust it to what fits you as you go on. Watch this video when you get time. It's a great video. And it is their training program that was designed to broaden their overall knowledge of how the multifaceted, most dynational organization operates. Inside, again, inside the, the factors of training methods delivery systems is cooperative training. And this is pretty straightforward. A training program that combines practical on-the-job experience with formal educational classes. This is part of the reason I picked 
this particular photo of Ron Pinkston uh, over my shoulder because you'll see Thomas Jefferson's library, formal types of training. But I'm also in Washington, D.C. with Ron Pinkston going through this. So it's the on-the-job practical side of training. And it's the combination of those two that create what is known as cooperative training. And simulations. Can you think of uh, a type of business or a type of career where simulations would be better than um, going out and practicing it, practice, practicing it first? I can. How about an airline pilot? I don't want an airline pilot up in that cockpit who's saying, well, I've never flown one before, but I'm looking forward to it. Other types of training methods, games that can be used. It's fascinating to see organizations actually creating games to train their employees. And I think that's a wonderful idea because as your textbook says, it creates engagement, it creates a fun component, even a fun competitive side to it. You might even be able to develop some games where teams are against each other inside the organization and then you have a really fun day at the end of it uh, to celebrate what everyone learned and then different forms of e-learning behavior modeling again you'll see jesus did this a learning approach in which workers behave behaviors are modeled or demonstrated and the trainees or the disciples are asked to mimic them to learn them and again segue towards uh, my mentor one of my mentors being over my shoulder role playing and coaching case studies, seminars, conferences, and blended learning. And then onboarding, uh, not waterboarding. Uh, don't use waterboarding as an approach to training your volunteers and employees. You're gonna have lots of absenteeism, lots of turnover, and maybe a lawsuit or two, so don't use that. This is onboarding. This is how to get somebody first started in your organization. And there's a video that uh, you'll see in your PowerPoint slides that will be helpful with this as well. This is it right here. Watch that one, you'll enjoy it. Basic training skills. And these are the basic skills that anyone would need. And then the team training. And you can even use adventure-based training, zip lines, or go somewhere for a day and everybody learns to just be still. Um, and then you talk about it while you have lunch. Go horseback riding as a team. I've done that with teams before. And my other favorite thing is to take people to the ocean and ask them to go walk the beach and find something that uh, the Holy Spirit might use to speak to them that particular day, and then we'll come together at lunch and talk about it. Uh, I'll let you break this down. This is some of the team training skills and the dynamics of those. Cross-training makes pretty, pretty much sense, right? You want people that can do multiple jobs on the job. Nowadays, I think that's a must. Um, we really can't have somebody just know how to do one thing. And then ethics training. Really important. Pay attention to the ethics. And in fact, I would say this goes way back to your, your mission of your organization. It goes to your recruitment, your hiring process, and certainly in your training and development. Make sure that ethics stays high on the list. Diversity and inclusion. Well, I tell you what, I have a mom, I have a wife, and I have two daughters, and I have my first grandchild is on the way in November and where my first grandbaby is going to be a girl. I'm pretty protective of the women in my family. And I think it's so important for us to be aware as men that God values women every bit as much. In fact, he tells us to treat women the way he treats the church. I don't know that I can even do that, but it sure lays a stiff challenge out in front of us for how we should behave and how we should honor the opposite sex. This is a pretty cool little uh, catchy design that they came up with here when it comes to the criterion for evaluating it. You'll see that even though it looks like it's one, two, three, four, it doesn't operate like that. It's the reactions, then the learning, then the behaviors, and then the bottom line results. What are we looking to see happen within our organization? Well, students, I'm proud of you. You're all doing really well. And again, if you have any need to contact me, you know how to do so. Blessings to you. Uh, that's what Jan Spencer always says to me. So I say blessings to you.